Um, all right, let's get started. We got we to finish up a few slides from last time and then uh, talk about HTML forms. I have to say that nice and slow because mixing up HTML and HTTP is a common thing. I don't think I slipped up yet this semester, but uh, my brain likes to mix up those two. So first thing, we have quite a bit more project information out. So you can start thinking, uh, thinking ahead, planning ahead to the project. Uh, I'll get the rest of it up by Friday, and we'll talk about the project for a bit during Friday's lecture. Uh, for now, I just want to say that there's more information. There's a section of the project requirements that has a note that says this is still in progress. I'll still add a bunch of more information to the specific requirements of the projects. Um, but I'll give you a, a very quick rundown right now is there are four separate project I uh, ideas, template, I don't know what to call them, but four different projects you can choose from, and then you'll work on one of those, and each one will have their specific requirements, what you need to build for that project. Uh, so take a look at that if you want to get a head start on what they are, and start talking with your teammates about which one of the four you want to work on. Uh, some specific requirements, stuff that I'll, I'll uh, talk about more in depth later, or on demand. If anybody asks, I'll answer specific questions at any time. Yeah, the, the full on lights is just absolutely way too bright. I think this is a little too bright, but the next one has the flashing lights on the side, so I can't go down further than this without getting really annoyed by those lights. So we didn't get to the JavaScript part of this. Let's do that now. Oh, why did I do that? Last time we talked about last time we talked about HTML and CSS. HTML is the, defining the structure of a page. CSS is defining the styling, and now JavaScript is giving us extra functionality. Last time we just talked about these ones. We covered that. Uh, we covered that, and we got to this one. I want to reemphasize this: the security aspect of this is so important. Let me uh, let me say this again. Uh, so JavaScript is a programming language, but when JavaScript is ran in the browser, as opposed to on Node.js, when it's ran in the browser, it has certain limitations. If you just downloaded somebody's code and ran it, which is what we do whenever we visit a page with JavaScript, which is like every page ever these days. You're downloading somebody else's code and running it. In general, that's an extremely dangerous thing to do. If I just said, here's a Java pro, well, if I did as a professor and said, here's the handout, you know, whatever. But if some random person says, here's some Java code, compile it and run it, you better be cautious. You better trust that person and uh, make sure there's no malicious code in there because they basically have full control over your computer at that point. They can just do whatever they want. So, we download and run JavaScript all the time. And the reason we do this somewhat confidently, there's still things that can go wrong. But we do that somewhat confidently because JavaScript has certain limitations. Can't read files, can't access other tabs or windows, and can't access storage from other websites. It can only access the storage for that domain name. The biggest one, I mentioned this last time, that is a bit limiting. The other two are like, you would only feel that if you were trying to attack somebody for the most part. But can't read write files is a big one. Uh, you can't create files and store files on a user's machine. I don't know really why you would want to do that. If you want to do that, use local storage. It's built into the browser. We have APIs for that and everything. Uh, but you can't read files either. Where this comes into play, where you're going to see this eventually in your web development career, uh, I, I feel like we've all, we all do this at some point. You'll do this at some point if you haven't already. You'll write a web page, and you'll have some file like a JSON file hosted by your server. And you want to read that file through an HTTP request, have the user save that file, and then in your JavaScript read that file. You can't do that. You can't read files on the user's machine, of course, because we don't want you go to a site and that site can just you know, read everything that you own, like everything stored on your hard drive. Obviously, we don't want that. But you can't even read files that came from your web server. And that's the important thing to note when we're developing, uh, that we do have this limitation. You cannot read 
Uh, you can't say open the index.html file that I just served to you and read that file. We can't do that. It's not allowed. It's not allowed for very good reason, security. But it is something that you have to think about when you're designing. When you're designing and implementing your web apps, it's something you do have to keep in mind. You can't even read your own files that the user downloaded. Now, you can use uh, something called AJAX. We'll, we'll talk about that if you, you don't know what that is already. Uh, but you can use AJAX, make a request to your server, get the response, and then read the response of that HTTP request. You just can't do that after the user stored that response in a file. Like making a, a CS request for CSS, for example, the user's going to save that response in a CSS file and then render it onto the page. You can't read that CSS, even though it's yours. But you could make an AJAX request for it and then read it that way, just not as a file. If you use images online, do I need to? Do you need to cite it? I'll say, don't violate any uh, any copyright policies. I'll leave that as my vague answer. Uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna worry about that for the projects, but that's between you and the owner of that image. If it's an open source image, obviously just use it. But if you're using that in your projects. I'll leave that between you and them. I'm worried about security things in this class. Uh, not so much. Uh, how do I word that? Like, it's not built into my grading policy to hit you for a copyright violation. I got enough to focus on with security. All right, so let's see some JavaScript. So here's a, a, just a very simple JavaScript. I've, again, I'm not going to do much with JavaScript, at least in this lecture. Um, but I just want enough out there for you to know what JavaScript is and how you can build some dynamic, dy, dynamicity, dy, make more dynamic web pages uh, with JavaScript. So I'm just going to show you a few things and leave the rest for self-study or as needed when we get later in the lecture. I'll have an application for JavaScript, and I'll be like, hey, remember when I showed you JavaScript? Here's something cool we can do. So here's something we can, can do. Get a specific element. I'm going to get an element by ID, my div, which in our HTML last time, my div was just an empty div that I said, we're going to use that div as a placeholder, and we're going to use that to add information using JavaScript later. Later is now. We're going to do that right now. So I'm going to get my div as a, uh, in a variable. This variable is that, uh, that element. Oh, I made these. I wrote this code a long time ago. I would use const these days instead of var for what it's worth. Uh, and then I can access and modify the properties of this, the variables stored in this object. Uh, one of those is inner HTML. I'm going to change the HTML of that div. Whatever's inside, whatever's in between the open and close tag for this element, I'm going to change what's inside there. I'm going to change it to content added from JavaScript. I'm going to separate this just like our CSS in script.js. You've seen this in project one, of course. Uh, there's three separate files and then the images. Uh, we're going to save this in a separate file and set it up to run when our page loads. Yeah. So if you wanted to run some kind of JavaScript function when a request is pulled in, um, would you maybe like return the value inside the div that you put in the HTML? If I, want, if I want it when a request is made? If you, Yes. Yeah. So you would actually modify the con what we're doing is modifying the content that the user is going to see by adding information in our elements. So if you want JavaScript that calls a method and then you want the return value of that method to be displayed to the user, uh, this is one way to do that. Grab the div that you wanted where you want to display that information and set the content of that div to whatever you want it to be. Then we've got to modify our HTML to import this JavaScript. Well, I say import. It's not quite importing. But to request this, uh, request this code, my div, we had this already. And now we're going to add a script tag 
a script element with a source for the script that's supposed to run. This is going to make another request to our server for uh, at the path script.js. We'll set up our server to host that JavaScript at script.js at that path, return the JavaScript, and then it's going to be executed. As soon as that response comes in, the browser is going to execute that script. That JavaScript is going to run. It's common to put our scripts at the bottom of the body of our page if we're running them as scripts. Uh, so there's a concern here. The, as soon as that request comes back for script.js, that JavaScript's going to run. There's a concern here. What if that comes back before my div exists, before it's rendered on the page? So if we put our scripts at the bottom of the body, we can guarantee that this is going to be rendered. It's going to exist in the DOM of the web page before our script executes, uh, which is still a little, uh, you can still have weird situations with this. Uh, so to be fully sure, maybe I should just did this in these slides, uh, is wrap all this in a function, and then on the body, set the onload property to run the function after the body is done loading. Then you guarantee that everything's loaded before your scripts run. Uh, sometimes you'll see script tags in the head. Usually that's if you have a library that you're importing. There's no harm in putting it in the head. Get that thing imported right away, and then uh, make sure it's imported before you start calling the functions and using that thing. But if it's a script that's meant to run immediately after it's downloaded, put it at the bottom of the body, or else you have a race condition. What's going to happen first? The browser rendering the web page or the script coming back. Usually it's going to render the web page first because that's a pretty quick operation. But if you have a lot of elements, maybe the network uh, request happens a little bit faster. You don't want those kind of bugs. Those are really tough to hunt down. Uh, so we want to avoid them by making sure everything executes in the proper order. So after we run, uh, after we load our page with this JavaScript, Instead of just having an empty div here, we're going to have our web page load, and then the JavaScript's going to run when it's downloaded and add extra content. Yeah? So you think this is from homework one? I mean, the current homework? Yeah, I mean, it's a little different. I don't have the emojis in this one, but yeah. Yeah, it's the same code, but at a different point in time. So we've modified it, our web page using JavaScript. Of course, you know, this we could have just put in the HTML. We're not doing anything super cool here. Um, but this is how we can modify our content using JavaScript. This is the foundation that we can use to build cooler shit. And even that isn't too interesting in the sense that it just loaded, like, OK, our HTML loaded, our JavaScript loaded, and wrote some more HTML. Uh, we didn't get anything dynamic there. So how do we build a page that's more dynamic? We want to respond to the user. We want the user to do things and our web page to react to the user. That's where JavaScript really comes into play. That's where we get some real power there. The user does something, JavaScript code executes, and then the user gets to see some change based on that. Uh, so to do that, we'll use an event-based architecture. Depending on when you took 116, you probably saw this. Uh, we're going to use event-based architectures, or let me reword that. JavaScript is built on an event-based architecture. So there are events that can occur, and we can respond and react to those events. You can add these right in your HTML elements. I, I just mentioned one, kind of not thinking about it. The onload for the body is an event. The body is done loading. The onload event occurs, and you can react to that event with the onload. Uh, here I'm using on mouse enter and on mouse leave, and I'm going to set these equal to some JavaScript code. Now I don't want a lot of JavaScript in my HTML. Ideally, you want none, which we can actually do, but we're using a different setup than this. We want to keep our stuff separated. HTML should be worried about the structure, not the functionality or the style. So to, uh, to the extent that we can, we're going to separate it. So I'm going to put those in separate functions. 
and say, when the user's mouse enters this element, I'm going to call make blue and pass a reference of this element to that function. Whenever the mouse leaves this element, I'm going to call make green and pass the element. So this div, whenever the user's mouse enters, is going to call make blue, which is going to get the element, which is a reference to the element that was entered, modify its style, and set the color to blue. When the mouse exits, I'm going to call make green and set the color to green. So we can have any JavaScript code we want running based on events that occur from the user. Yeah. Is the element that's passed to do it the whole div? Yeah, in this case, it's the whole div. So in this context, this will be the element with that attribute. So like I could I could change the class if I wanted to or the ID like I can I have that entire element I can set the inner HTML and do whatever I want to this thing I can even remove the on mouse ender thing once it enters and have it only happen once we can do anything we want I already explained that slide. And I don't want to cover these. I have a whole lecture in a few weeks about this. I don't want to, I don't want to talk about that quite yet. We got other things to talk about. Any questions on any of that, though? Then, of course, W3 schools, I'll keep referencing this when I talk about front end. Uh, to get there's tons of different events that occur all the time. You can uh, like if you want something that follows uh, the user's mouse around. You want like a trail. No, that's a that's why did I come up with that example? Um, but as the user's mouse is moving, you can get the location of their mouse. So you can use that information as well. Uh, whenever they hit a key on the keyboard, you can get any really anything the user is doing is triggering an event in JavaScript that you can react to. Uh, so there's a lot of power that we get with this. We can build anything we can imagine. Um, I guess within reason. Do I have to qualify that? We can build anything we can imagine. It just might take a long time to build. All right, so let's talk about HTTP, HTTP post and specifically forms. I want to talk about uh, making post requests with forms. So far, we've only made post requests with Postman. We want our users to be able to create post requests. Uh, first, I want to talk about query strings. I, I used to have a homework objective where you had to mess around with query string, strings. I removed it because I thought it was kind of boring. But I still want to tell you what a query string is, and specifically the format, because the format is used outside of query strings. So a quick reminder on what a query string is. It's part of the URL that adds extra information to the URL. So it is a way of users sending information to the server, which is what we eventually want to do in a better way, though, throughout this lecture. Uh, and this is commonly used if you make a, a search at, for, uh, with any search engine that I've seen, Google included, you make a search and then look at the URL for that search. You might have to click the URL bar because URL bars like to shorten the URLs to just the domain name these days. But if you click on it, It'll show you the query string, and your search is actually part of the URL that was requested. You're making a GET request, and your search and any extra parameters are just in the URL. So this is very commonly used. And a reminder, URL protocol, host, port, path, query string, fragment. Uh, so we're at query string right here. You're parsing paths in your homework. You're doing plenty of that. Host and port, uh, right now you have localhost or 0000. Port, uh, we've seen these, 8,000, things like that. Protocol has always been HTTP. We, we're familiar with all these parts of, um, of the URL. We're not going to talk about fragments. I just don't have too much to say about them. But uh, let's talk about query strings right now. Query string is anything after the question mark and ends if there is a hashtag, ends before the hashtag. And query strings are in this format. We have a question mark in the path 
or after the path, I suppose. And the question mark says, we're about to start a query string. That query string is a series of key value pairs. Keys and values are separated by an equal sign, and key value pairs are separated by ampersands. So that's the format of a query string. And we have some other special characters, like the plus here is used to say that this, uh, this key maps to multiple values. So this is a DuckDuckGo search. Q for query, I did a search for web development, web space development, and they replaced my space with a plus sign. And then ampersand, IA images, I forget what the IA stands for, but this is an image search for web development. If you just paste this URL, or type this URL into your URL bar, it'll perform that search for you. Search engines give us a nice box where we can type our searches so we're not ma uh, manually typing URLs with query strings, because who wants to do that? These can only contain ASCII characters. So this will be part of the path of the request. Everything in the headers of an HTTP request, as we know, are ASCII only. So that's going to include the path. Query strings part of the path. ASCII only characters. It's part of the standard. It's just part of HTTP. ASCII only. If we want a non-ASCII character, URLs are going to percent encode those characters. This is a special format where, where we use a percent sign and then a two-digit hex value for each byte. So we can represent any byte values that we want in a, uh, in a query string, but we have to percent encode them. So if I want this, if I do a search for this character, the search engine, before it makes the request, the front end code is going to percent encode that character into percent ed, percent 95, percent 9c. This is the ASCII character, or the uh, UTF-8 representation of that character, and that's what's going to go in the URL. So we can still get UTF-8 characters in our URLs. Uh, even non ASCII, uh, non even non-ASCII UTF-8 characters, no, even ASCII characters can be percent encoded. I got there. Even ASCII characters can be percent encoded in the same way. Uh, a single space is the ASCII character 2-0 in hex, uh, so we can percent encode that as well. That's very useful because spaces aren't allowed in paths. Say space was allowed in paths, right? Uh, by the way, the uh, I think I officially say this in the next slide, but, uh, or two slides from now, but a URL string is just going to show up as part of the path in your HTTP request. So you have the method, say it's a get request, space, the path including the query string and fragment if it exists, space, HTTP version. If we allow spaces in our query strings or anywhere in our, our path for our URL, that's going to break your parsing code, because you're looking for two spaces, and everything between the two spaces is the path. We allow a space in there, it's going to break your parsing code. Not just your parsing code, but everybody's parsing code, because that's the definition of, that's part of the definition of HTTP, is you look for those spaces, and that's how you parse the request line. So if we start allowing spaces in other places, it's going to break everything on the internet. We can't allow spaces in, in uh, URLs. So we percent encode them. If you ever see a percent 20 in a URL, you've probably seen this before and uh, either wondered what it was or just didn't care or whatever. Uh, either is fine. But if you see these percent 20s in your URLs, that's just a percent encoded space. I mean, somebody had a space in their URLs. Search engines usually use pluses, but uh, you'll see percent 20s in a lot of URLs. There are reserved characters, so if you ever want to use a reserved character in a query string or in a URL in general, percent encode that thing. Uh, some of these reserved characters are, are, you know, of course used in the URL. Uh, protocol, colon, slash, slash, ampersands, pluses, equals. We just saw all those used in the query string notation itself. Hashtag to denote the start of a fragment. We use these characters in URLs, so we can't use them in our query strings. If we use them, we got to percent encode them. But we have a handful of notable non-reserved special characters, dash, dot, underscore, and tilde, and we use these to great effect, great extent on the internet. We use these all over the place. 
because they're the only special characters we're really allowed to use, at least in URLs. Yeah, URLs use underscore all the time. These, uh, these slides, like, oh, I shouldn't have done this. The, the URL for these slides uses underscores and a period. We use those all the time to great effect. Oops, spoilers. What the? Here we go. <laughs> OK. So let, let's, uh, so let's transition into forms. So, so far we've just built static web pages. Static meaning that the content of the page doesn't change. You're just making a request for the HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript, the images, and none of that content ever changes. You're always serving the same HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and images. Uh, it's, every path always returns the same content. Uh, this is kind of boring. We want pages that are dynamic. We want our users. Really, we want apps where users are interacting with each other. That's where the internet gets more exciting. I would go to YouTube. I want to see videos that other users posted. Uh, like that's what makes the internet really the internet. Like without that, no social media would exist. Like nothing would be out there. Uh, so we want dynamic pages, and this is where we're finally going to shift from making websites to the namesake of this course, web applications, where they're actually. Uh, where they're actually apps that are doing things, not just serving static content. And forms are going to be our entry point into that world. So forms are going to give us a way for our users to send information to our servers. And what we're concerned about in this class is the structure of the HTTP requests that are created when a form is submitted. So here's our, our first form. We're going to go through all the parts of this thing. When somebody submits this form, an HTTP request is sent containing all of the information that the user input into the form. You're go that's an HTTP request. Your server is going to respond with an HTTP response, just like any other request. And whatever you respond with, the page will reload with that content. So when you submit a form, the page will reload. I'll put an asterisk on that. When you're using plain HTML forms like we are right now. Of course, you use tons of forms on the internet that don't, don't reload the page. And we will talk about that a lot. But for now, we have a form. We submit this. The page will reload with whatever the contents of the response are. For homework two, you're going to respond with a redirect back to your home page. So we won't worry about loading extra content when this form submitted is return with a redirect. So let's pick up this thing apart and talk about each piece of it. So the form element itself has uh, these two properties that we have to specify to get the behavior we want. The action, which is going to be the path of the request that's made. So on my server, somebody submits this form. I'm going to be expecting request for form-path. And whenever I get a request for the path form path, I'm, that's where I'm going to write my code of how to handle those form requests. I'm going to be expecting form requ requests at that path. And then method, the HTTP method being used for those requests. Get for this instance, of course, the, this lecture is all about HTTP post, so we'll get there. But for now, a get request. And to specify the parts of a form, we're going to use input elements. And we're going to set the type of those elements to whatever type we want. I have type text here, so I'm going to get a text box. And I'm going to set the name to something that I'm going to remember. And then when I get a request to my server, the name is going to be where I get that information. I'm going to look for something with the name of commenter. And that's going to have the value that the user entered into that form element. So I have commenter and comment, both as text boxes. And then I'm going to get a request that has commenter and comment. I can parse that and do what I need to do with it. You 
really should provide a label for every input on your form. Please do this. I don't talk about front end that much. I just show you like the crappiest front ends and leave it at that. Uh, but this is one thing that is super important. Uh, put labels on all of your forms. Please, please. And use the ID and the for. So I have an input with ID form name. And the label is for the form name. I'm using my HTML attributes to set that and say that this label relates to this input. Uh, there's a few reasons to do this. One, a very, uh, very practical, very important accessibility thing. Uh, there are a lot of people who navigate the internet only with screen readers. And if you just have this text sitting next to your element, uh, it's not clear when listening to the screen reader that that element, that text input is for uh, entering your name. Especially if you have some really complex structure in your HTML and things uh, visually line up fine, but in your elements and in your HTML, everything's just all over the place. It can be tough, uh, tough to figure that out if you can't use your visuals. Uh, the other one, uh, for everybody, not just screen readers, click on the label focuses the input. This one frustrates the hell out of me when, uh, uh, when this isn't the case, especially with radio buttons. Uh, right now, if I click on enter your name, this text, anywhere on this text, it'll highlight this and I can start typing. Uh, for radio buttons, you got those little circle buttons everywhere around the internet. I don't like having to click exactly on that circle. I want to click anywhere on that label to be able to get that, uh, to get that selected. Like for your lecture questions, I made sure that when you click on the letter A, B, D, uh, A, B, C, D, or E, it'll select that button. Uh, that's because I have that label set up for that input, and uh, you can click it. So not only does it frustrate me, I also know that the developers of that website weren't thinking about screen readers or accessibility. So it's double frustrating. Yes? So the for attribute redirects you to the ID one when you click on the text on the label? Yeah. Gotcha. Yep. So if I click anywhere on this text, I'll get this selected. For a text box, not, you know, not the worst thing. But for a, for a radio button or a checkbox, I want to click on anywhere on that text related to that thing. So if you ever don't have that feature on a site, you know they didn't set up their labels. And then finally, an input of type submit is going to create a button. And whatever you have for the value of this button is going to be what's on the button itself. I have a value of submit with a capital S, so my button says submit on it. Uh, type submit with a lowercase s says make a button. And then whatever I want, I can type whatever I want here, and that's what's displayed on the button. Okay, so that's our form element. That's the front end side of things. Now on the back end, when I fill out this form and click submit, this is what I'm going to see on uh, my server. You get an HTTP request, like you've been parsing for homework one. And you're going to get a request that looks like this. The request line is going to look like this. I'm omitting the headers, of course. But the request line, it's a git. It's HTTP 1.1. But everything else, form path, is whatever I specified here. And everything else is the query string, which is a URL encoded with percent encoding a representation of the content of the form. So the name, like commenter, the name of the element, and then equals whatever I typed into that element, spaces for what it's worth. Uh, represented as pluses instead of percent 20s. And then my exclama exclamation point, that's a reserved character, so it got percent encoded to percent 21. And that's what you would end up parsing if I still had a query string objective on homework. You'd parse this mess, and it, it just got tedious, and you didn't learn much about web servers and web apps by doing it, so I scrapped it. Uh, there are limitations to using a GET request here. Of course, we're going to use POST. That's where, where this is headed. Um, there are limitations to using GET requests. There are limitations to the size of a URL itself. URLs can only be so long. There's no official standard that says URLs can't be longer than X. But each browser, each web server, if you're using a reverse proxy like Nginx, uh, they're all going to have a built-in limitation to the size of a URL. And they're also going to have a built-in limitation to the size of an HTTP request or response. 
So if I'm trying to put a you know, whole novel or the B movie or something into a form, it, if it's using a git request with URL encoding as a query string, it's not going to work for us. It's going to hit these limits and we're not going to be able to submit. Uh, and then what if we want to send a file? What if I want to upload a, a 10 megabyte image? I'm not going to be able to do it this way. It's just not going to work. So severe limitations by doing it this way. So enter post requests. Uh, we know what post request is here, so I can skip a bit of this because uh, I want to get to the end of these. So when you parse a post request, you're looking for that blank line. That's separating your headers from the content. And you're going to read the content length to see how much content you need to read. And you're going to make sure you read that many bytes after that slash r slash n slash r slash n. If you don't read that many bytes, you still have more information to read, and you need to go back to your TCP socket and read some more information. Homework one's designed so you never have to do that. Homework two, you will be doing that. You know, there will be times where the body is so large that you're not reading it all in one go, or even for small bodies sometimes. There's too much content to get in one read from your TCP socket, so you're going to have to go back and read some more. It's something we're, we're really going to have to think about. Uh, I'll, I'll cover that aspect of this much more in depth when I, we talk about buffers, but for now I'll leave it at that. So we're going to change method to post. Just a little bit of a change in our HTML. And now our requests are going to look like this. Still not what we want. This isn't our stopping point. It's going to look like this. We're going to get our post request for just that path, no query string. And what was the query string is going to be directly the content of the request, the content of the body of that request. So uh, it, it's a little nicer. We avoid the limitations of the header length, length and the URL length. Uh, we can send tons of information like this. That's good. But we're still URL encoded the way a query string was which means we have to worry about percent encoding if we want to send non-ASCII or special characters. It's good. We're getting there. But I want something a little better. So we're going to change what's called the encoding type. There are three encoding types that you can use for HTML forms. One, the default URL encoded. That's what we already saw on the previous slide. Uh, one is plain text which you should never use, and even the documentation on it says never use this unless you have a very specific debugging process. Never use this in production. And the one we'll actually use, multi-part form data. This is the one we're going to use extensively, and it's what you'll spend many hours of your life on in homework two, parsing these requests of this format. Uh, so a heads up on that. Next lecture will be all about parsing this format. Uh, right now, I just want to introduce the format to you. When you make a multi-part form request, you're going to get a request that looks like this mess. It all makes sense, and it's, uh, it's all important. Uh, for now, I don't want to talk too much about it, except you're going to get the content type with a boundary. That boundary is going to separate each piece of content. Each piece of content will be a separate part of the body, and each one will have its own headers, which at least includes the content disposition, which is similar to the content type which will have, importantly for us, the name of that, uh, of that value. And then a blank line, slash r, slash n, slash r, slash n. And then the content for that piece of information, that part of the form. So each form element is getting a separate part of the HTTP request. And the body is separated by these boundaries so we can get each part individually. And now, nothing's URL encoded. We're in the body of the request, so we're not, uh, we're not confined to ASCII only. We're not URL encoding, so there's no percent encoding. We just get the bytes of our information in the body of each part. If you want to upload a file, you've got to do this. Uh, you, if you've built a page that uploads files before, you, you know that you've had to set the encoding type to multi-part form. And you might have wondered why or whatever. Uh, this is why. It's the only way to send a file. You can't send a file URL encoded. So even if you're using libraries and frameworks and everything, you still had to do this in your HTML, set that encoding type to uh, multi-part form data. Much more about parsing this format and what the format even is in the next lecture.
And just real quick, the, uh, I just want to splash a few more form elements out there. Uh, I, this is the point where I would usually say there are a lot more form elements out there. Go to W3 schools. I'm still going to say that. I'm still saying that right now. Um, but just to show you that we do have a lot of easy power with forms just in HTML itself, uh, I want to show you a couple of them. Here are radio buttons. And these, this is what I was just talking about. We need our labels. So I can click on three, and it will select three. I can click on two. If without the labels, you have to actually click the radio button itself. It gets painful. I don't know. Maybe I'm nitpicking, but I don't know. At this point in the internet, I expect usability features like that. I feel like that's the bare minimum I could ask. Uh, so when we do radio buttons, give each button the same name. If they all have the same name, that's going to give us the property where only one of the, the buttons can be selected at a time. Only one button with that name can be selected. And give each one a value. The value is what's going to be received by the server for that name is the value for each button. Drop downs, kind of similar, but a little bit different setup. We use a select and then options. And give the value for each option, and the name goes in the select, and we get a drop down box like this. Oh, come on. Any questions? No questions in Discord. Since SEO was brought up, uh, I wasn't going to mention this, but I can. Uh, the difference between a, a dash and an underscore is really important when it comes to SEO. If you have in your uh, URLs and stuff, if you have a URL with underscores, that's treated as a single like single word, it's a single thing. I have underscores in my URL, and if I double click that, it's going to select the entire phrase, I guess, for lack of a better term, that's connected by the underscores. If I'm using dashes, they're treated as separate words. So if I have dashes here instead of underscores, now it's only going to highlight one. Those are treated as separate words then. So it's important to use which, which one you use is very important when it comes to SEO, search engine optimization. You're trying to play the Google game and trying to get number one on the search results. Deciding whether to use a dash or an underscore is a really big decision. I never really got an SEO, so I don't care. But I just use underscores all the time. But, uh, but that is an important thing in that world. I, I don't know what I'm doing. React is better than HTML. Yeah, you're not wrong. I mean, yeah, you need HTML still, but uh, better than uh, just vanilla JavaScript, probably. Uh, the, what's that? Yeah, re yeah, React can be a beast, but, but React, uh, I'm showing you, again, I'm not showing you much front end stuff, but if you want to delve into front end and get some really nice functionality, maybe you want to use it for your project, uh, check out React. Go through some tutorials and, and learn how to use that. If you take, uh, if you take uh, Alan Hunt's HCI, Human Computer Interaction, uh, he'll show you a bunch of React and you use React throughout that course. I think he restricts you to React in that course. He should if he doesn't. Uh, React is, is just kind of dominated the landscape. Uh, Angular was a big competitor, but Angular kind of has kind of fallen off. Uh, and Vue exists, but it's just not used, as used in industry. React is really used as a front-end framework, so you're not writing just plain JavaScript like we are here. You'll never write dot inner HTML when you're using React. Yeah, I don't got anything else. No questions. Let's just do this. Uh, have a great day. I'll see you all Friday.